When I was a kid, I was always really confused about this holiday that we call Labor Day. I mean, when you think about it, shouldn't we call it No Labor Day? I was really confused. Why does nobody go to work on Labor Day? So, but, you know, now that I live in New Jersey, and I've lived in New Jersey now for, for about 16 and a half years, and I've realized that in New Jersey, like, Labor Day is a really important holiday everywhere, but it's like super, super important in New Jersey. Because as we all know, the purpose of Labor Day is, I mean, the meaning of Labor Day is that, you know, it's when the Garden State Parkway becomes the Garden State parking lot. That's the, that's the meaning of Labor Day weekend for us, for us here. I was actually, you know, I, so the title of the message this morning is Labor Day. And, and what I want to do is talk a little bit about the importance of our work. And as Christians, what does it mean for us to work for the Lord um, and to do our work to God's glory? And so I want to I do that, and I want to go to the first book of the Bible in order to do that together um, this morning. And, you know, as I was thinking about, you know, what to call the message, I, I really couldn't come with it, up with anything better than just, let's just call it Labor Day. And in order to do that, I wanted to do a little bit of research, a little bit of background on what exactly is Labor Day all about. Because, again, as, as I was growing up, I was always really confused about what the purpose, I mean, you know, think about Easter, that's really obvious. Christmas, that's really obvious. Even Memorial Day, like, we, we get that. Veterans Day, like, we, we, it's, it all seemed really obvious. But Labor Day is like that one's like, we really like Labor Day because we get a long weekend, but we really don't fully grasp what exactly it is. What are we celebrating anyway? So what I did was I did what, what every good Gen X person would do, and that is to go to the Internet and do some research. And so now I, because as we all know, they can't put anything on the internet that's not true. And so I went to the internet to do some research on the background of Labor Day. And even worse yet, I actually went to Wikipedia to do my research. And so if you're a student here, please don't ever take my, my example on this. You should never do any background research or use Wikipedia as like a work, on your work site at page. That's like a big no-no in school. So do as I say, not as I do kind of a thing. Um, but I did my research for this message from Wikipedia on Labor Day. This is what I found on Wikipedia in regards to Labor Day. It says this. This is the first paragraph right on Wikipedia regarding Labor Day. It says, Labor Day in the United States is a public holiday celebrated on the first Monday in September. It honors the American labor movement and the contributions that workers have made to the strength, prosperity, laws, and well-being of the country. It is the Monday of the long weekend known as Labor Day weekend, and it is considered the unofficial end of summer in the United States. Boo, right? The unofficial end of summer. Like, we don't want to hear about that part. I hate, that's the part about Labor Day that we can't stand. Like, summer is kind of like coming to an end now, and, you know, everything down at the shore is going to start closing up. They're going to close up all the shops pretty soon. And it's just this kind of like a sad weekend for some of us. Um, so, but anyway, the thrust of the message on this Labor Day weekend is that for, for many of us, typically, when we think about the word worship, like when you hear that word worship, what is it that comes to mind when you hear that word? Probably for many of us, if not most of us, the, the thought that comes to mind is music. When we think about worship, we think about music and, and maybe even a, a particular genre of music. Or maybe for you, when you hear the word worship, maybe for you, you think of going to a worship service. Like that is what worship means to you. I know when I was growing up, you know, if you were going to be a good Christian, to be a good Christian in our church growing up meant that you went to three worship services every single week. Sunday morning. Sunday night and Wednesday night. And because, as we all know, the only way to be a good Christian is to attend three worship services every week. If you go to three worship services, that check the box, that automatically means you're a good Christian if you do that. And so that's what I, that was just what was kind of ingrained in me when I was growing up. Like a worship, so that's where worship happens, when you go to the worship service. I, sometimes I tell people that when I was a teenager... You know, I had a really serious drug problem. You know, my mom drugged me to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. That was my drug problem when I was a teenager. And so, but I, I guess maybe for some pastors, they think that if they can just keep their people busy 
by going to enough meetings, then they won't have time for sin, right? So we go to church three times a week, and then we serve in a ministry on Thursday night, and we go out to do evangelism on Tuesday night, and, you know, we've got all these programs where everybody's at church all the time, and there's never actually any opportunity to be the hands and feet of Christ in our community. And so we just, I guess some pastors just think, let's keep everybody busy, and then they won't sin. But I, I don't know about you, but for me, like, that doesn't work. Even when I'm busy, I'm still sinning. And so what is it that we call worship? Like, what does that mean? Because what I want to say to you is that worship ought to include every aspect of your life. Like, all day, every day, you ought to be worshiping. And that even includes on Monday morning when you wake up, that alarm clock goes off, and you get ready, and you go into the office, that when you go to work, going to work is an opportunity for you to worship. And that's the big idea for this morning. We're going to kind of unpack this, but work is a way to worship. Your work, your career, your job, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, whether you're a homeschool mom, whether you're in the workforce dad, or in the workforce mom, When you go to work every Monday morning, that is an opportunity for you to use your strengths, your gifts, your abilities, your talents for God and for His glory. And so work is an opportunity for us to worship. And I know what you're thinking. Well, yeah, that's easy for you to say because you're a pastor. It's easy for you to view work as as worship because you get to pray and read your Bible and listen to Caleb all day. Like That's all you have to do. And you're always with Christians all the time, all day long. And I guess that's true to a certain extent. I get it. But maybe you look at me as kind of like a professional Christian. Right? And you're thinking, yeah, you get paid to be good. So does that mean you're good for nothing? Is that what we're saying? I mean, what are we saying by that? So, but in all seriousness, so many people look at their, what we would call their secular job and as just something that they have to endure in order to, you know, put a roof over their head or to put food on the table. But is that the full extent of what God wants for us? Is that what he wants to come out of our work, that we just get a paycheck, that we just get a roof over our head, we get clothes on our back, we get food on the table, we can provide for our family? Is that really all that God wants for us when it comes to our work? I don't think so. In fact, you know the Bible has a whole heck of a lot to say on the topic of work. In fact, if you look at the parables of Jesus, almost every single parable that Jesus told in the New Testament in the Gospels happened in the context of work. Did you know that? The Bible has a lot to say about our work. It has a lot to say on this topic. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at several passages of Scripture this morning, but I want to start in the very first book of the Bible, in the second chapter of the first book of the Bible, and we're going to start in verse 1. And so I want you to look with me at Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. I'll be reading from the ESV. It says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And here's what I want you to do. As we kind of go through this passage, I want you to look at all the different places where it uses the word Work. All right, so we're, we're, we're trying to look for the word work. All right, this is a word search. This is a word find. And on the seventh day, God finished his what? Work what, that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature." And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and it became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. 
It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. Interesting side note, when I was a teenager, my best friend in high school, my freshman year, he started a new band. It was a rock band. And they named their band Havilah because he wanted to make a lot of gold. So it says, it says, it was around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bdellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the, land, and the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east out of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And then listen to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to what? Work it. Work it. Work it, girl. <laughs> he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So why did God put Adam in the garden? To work. To work the garden. To work in the garden and to keep it. So work is a way to worship. Work is a way to worship. Before we go any further, before we unpack this passage and look at some other scriptures, can we take a moment to bow our heads, quiet our hearts, and would you just pray right there in your seat and ask God to speak to you through his word this morning? God, we're thankful for the opportunity to come together, Lord, to worship you with our song, to worship you with our giving, Lord, to worship you as we we lift up our voices, and Lord, as we pray, and Lord, all these different ways that we worship you here on Sunday morning, but God, so often we don't view what we do throughout the rest of the week as an opportunity to worship you. And so God, I pray that you would instruct us, that you would teach us what it is that you want us to know about the importance of our work and how we can give glory to you, even through our career. God, we love you. Pray that you would speak to us now. Enlighten us through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. One of the really cool things that you're going to find as you do a study on this particular topic is that there are are a few different words in the Old Testament, in Hebrew. The Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. In the Old Testament, there's several different words that are used for work. And... Here in Genesis chapter 2, we have a particular word that's being used, and it's the word abad, abad. And maybe some of you think that's what work is. Like, it's a bad deal. Like every morning I have to wake up, I have to go to work, it's a bad thing. Um, but I th- Now, here's the thing. In Hebrew, you pronounce that B as a V. So everyone say avad, avad. So that's the Hebrew word that we're dealing with here in Genesis chapter 2. And so, and here's the thing. If, I don't know if you knew this or not. Did you know Eskimos have over a hundred different words for snow? Because there's different, you know, different ways that snow forms. and There's different types of snow. And so Eskimos, try, trying to figure out the different nuances of the snow that's always around them, they have over a hundred different words to explain the different types of snow that they see in the Arctic Circle. Why do they do that? It's because language has a unique ability to create distinctions between things in our minds. It's like in the New Testament when you come to the word love. You know, we only have one word for love. It's love in English. But in the Greek, in the New Testament, there's agape love. That's unconditional love. That's God's love for us. There's eros love. That's passionate love. That's where we get the word erotic. It has, it's the sensual type of love between a man and a woman. And then there's phileo love, where we get the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, phileo Delphia, the city of brotherly love or best friend love. And so there's different kind of contexts in which we use love. Like if I say I love my wife and if I say I love Taco Bell, hopefully those are two different types of love, right? Hopefully we're not talking about the same thing. And so in the same way, so in the Old Testament, there's different words for the word work. And here in Genesis 2, it's this word avad. And so what does this word avad mean? Because here's the thing, when we talk about work and when we talk about um, worship and the context of work, sometimes like we don't put those two thoughts together. But for the ancient Hebrews, like for the Jews, like growing up, they understood like there was a correlation between our faith and our work. Or at least there should be. Like those two things ought to come together 
in our lives. They ought to go hand in hand. Work and worship should go hand in hand. They're really not two separate things. Like work is what I do during the week and then on Sunday I worship. No, that's a, that's a wrong understanding of what work and what worship is supposed to be. So it probably shouldn't surprise us then that they used the same word for work that they used for worship. Did you know that? So the word avad simultaneously means to work. It's talking about the idea of service and it's the idea of worship. That's what this Hebrew word avad means, if we can go to that next slide. So there, I want you to write that down in your outline. Avad means work or service or worship. It can be used in any of those contexts in the Old Testament. And there's various usages of this Hebrew word found in Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. Where in Genesis 2 we see God is telling us that his original design and his original desire is that our work and our worship should be a seamless way of living. In some verses in the Old Testament, the word avad means work, as in like to work in the field or like to have a career, to have a job, and you do physical labor. But when God was introducing his covenant to his people, in Exodus chapter 34, verse 21, he said this to Moses. Look at verse 21 of Exodus 34. Six days you shall avad, six days you shall labor, six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall what? Shavath. You shall what? English word do you think we get from Shavath in Hebrew? Sabbath. You shall Sabbath. Six days you will avad, and then one day you shall Sabbath. You shall rest. Even during the plowing season and harvest, you must Shavath. You must rest. You must Sabbath. That means if you're an accountant, even on April, you know, 1st, when things are really getting busy, you don't work seven days a week. Even when it's really busy, even during the plowing season and the harvest, you must Shavath. You must rest. Six days you'll work, one day you'll rest. But he uses the word avad here in the Hebrew to tell us what that work is to look like. So God wants us to avad. He wants us to work and then one day a week, he wants us to Sabbath. He wants us to Shavath. He wants us to rest. And maybe for you, that looks like working your secular job five days a week. That's how many days most of us work, right? We got a nine to five, Monday through Friday. Not all of us, but most of us. That's what a work week normally looks like. And then you work around the house one day a week. But then there's supposed to be one day a week where you Shavath where you rest, where you don't do any work, where you just relax, where you rest, where you enjoy your family and you enjoy worshiping God together. And when you just Shavath, when you just Sabbath to let your body recover and your mind unwind, that's a good thing. And God wants you to do that every week. But I have to be honest with you, I have a really hard time with that. A lot of people have a really hard time with taking one day a week where it's just a down day where they're not going to do any labor, they're not going to do any work, they're not going to do any avad other than just worshiping, not the working part, where they're just going to shavath, they're just going to rest, they're just going to have that Sabbath day to recover both in their physical strength and in their mental and emotional strength. And I know, you know maybe for some of you, you think, yeah, but he's a pastor. I thought he'd just work one day a week. <laughs> Isn't that what most people think? Pastors only work one day a week. But the truth is that most pastors end up working 50 plus hours a week on average. And here's the thing. We don't get paid overtime when we work 50 plus hours a week like you do. And so God wants us to rest. And for many, many pastors, myself included, that's a really hard thing to do. Because there's always phone calls to return, there's always emails to send, there's always meetings to go to, there's always counseling sessions to set up. And so it's easy for a pastor to just work all seven days a week and never have a Sabbath rest. 
And so what happens for many pastors is we work a normal day, you know, just like you, a nine to five. And then at night we have counseling sessions we have to go to because that's when you're off work. So we have to meet with you when you're available. Or we have other meetings, elders meetings and deacons meetings and missions committee meetings on the weekends. And we have men's breakfasts and we have, you know, small groups to go to. And so it's just easy to allow the hours to rack up really fast for most pastors. And so we even have to take a day of rest. That's what God wants for us. For me personally, I try to do my best to take off every Tuesday. It doesn't always work out, but that is the time that I kind of set aside where I try not to do too much work because it's still a temptation for me. So pray for me because it's a temptation for me to work every day, to do some work on every single day of the week, even though God tells us he doesn't want us to do that. He says, six days you are to Avad and one day you are to Shavath. But for many of us, That's a difficult thing for us to do. But God wants us to see that work is a way to worship. God wants us to view our work as an opportunity for us to glorify him even through that work as we give him glory, as we give him honor, as we give him worship. All right, let's look at another example in the Old Testament where this word avad is used, but it's translated in a different way. This time it's translated as the word worship. So we've seen it translated as the word work. Now let's see the same word being translated as worship. This is Moses He's uh, before the burning bush. He's out. Mount, he's at, in Mount Horeb, um, in uh, Mount, near what we would call now Mount Sinai, but originally it was called Mount Horeb. And Exodus chapter three, verses eleven and twelve, it says this. But Moses said to God, "Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt?" And he said, "Certainly I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you." When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall, what? Avad on this mountain. You shall work on this mountain. It's not really the idea here. You shall worship on this mountain. This same mountain where I'm meeting with you, where this burning bush is, and I am giving you instructions as to what it is that I'm calling you to, Moses, Moses, This is where you're going to come back with the people once I have set them free. And you are going to collectively together worship me on this exact same mountain. That's what God desires for us. He desires for us to worship him. So the word for working is the same word used for worshiping God. And to me that is a powerful image. A vad is a picture of an integrated life. Where our work is a way in which we worship God. A life where work and worship go hand in hand. Because again, so often we think of worship as something we can only do on Sunday morning. Or something we can only do in the morning. You know, we get up, we have our quiet time, we open the Bible, we pray, we worship, but then we have to go to work. Right? Worship time's over, now it's time to go to work. But for the ancient Hebrews they wouldn't have understood that kind of a thought process because they saw a vad, they saw work as an opportunity to worship. And so God uses this word in the context of both categories. And God designed us, not for this dichotomy between Sunday morning and Monday morning. God designed us to see Sunday morning as an opportunity to worship together collectively as the body of Christ and Monday morning the opportunity for us to scatter and go to our places of employment and continue our worship there as we do the work that God created for us to do. So Avad suggests that our work can be a form of worship where we're honoring the Lord. And how do we do that? Well, God's given you, he's given me, he's given us some skills Unique skills, he's given you some abilities that he didn't give to me, and he's given me some abilities that he didn't give to you. He's given all of us a unique thumbprint, a unique image, and so he wants all of us to use those gifts and those talents, those abilities, those skills, that personality that he's given to you, and he wants you to use those gifts. You've been shaped by God to glorify him, and he wants you to use those skills and those abilities in order to be not only a blessing to him, but the way you get to be a blessing to him, to, to him is by being a blessing to others. 
So when you think about Genesis chapter 2, what happens in Genesis chapter 3, first of all? Does anybody know what happens in Genesis chapter 3? It's a very important chapter of the Bible. Something very bad happens in Genesis chapter 3. It's what we call the fall, right? It's when Adam and Eve eat of the forbidden fruit and they fall into sin and their eyes are open and everything changes. So Genesis chapter 2 is before the fall, right? But it's in Genesis chapter 2 that God tells Adam, I designed you for work. So what does that tell us? That tells us that work is not a bad thing. Work is not bad. Work is good. God designed us to work. He wants us to work. He's given us gifts and abilities and talents so that we can work and, and earn a living and make this world a better place. And that all happened before the fall. God designed Adam to work the garden and to keep it, and that was before the fall. Now, as a result of the fall, that changes a lot of things for us. It changed our world forever. But what I want you to understand is that when God put Adam in the garden, this is not what God said. God did not say, now listen, Adam, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray. I want you to read your Bible. And I want you to make sure that you stay away from a few bad apples. That's not what God said to Adam when he put him in the garden. That's not God's idea of worship. No, Adam was to have a living, vibrant relationship with God. And one of the main ways that he was to worship God was by going to work. Was by seeing work as an opportunity to worship the Lord. It wasn't like God designed Adam to sit around all day and eat Twinkies and have angels massage his feet. That is not what God designed Adam for. You know, but then he sinned and said, oh, now he's got to get a job. No, that's not how it went down in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. God designed Adam for work. You know, some people like to whistle while they work. Like Snow White. <laughs> I can't whistle very well, but you know, you remember the song? Snow White said, whistle while you work. That'll make the work better. But God, I mean, you can whistle while you work if you want. I'm not very good at it, so I don't do it. But God wants you to worship while you work. That's what God designed you for, to worship him even while you're working. And the reason why God designed you for that is because God created you in his image. It's, the, it's in Latin, we call it imago dei. God created us in his image. In the image of God, he created man and woman. In Genesis 1.27, if you go back just one chapter, it says God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And what do we see God doing before all of that? He's creating other things. God is using his creativity as he is doing work. He is creating things. And it says in Genesis chapter 1 on uh, four different occasions in verse 10. If you look back at Genesis 1 in verse 10, in verse 12, in verse 18, and in verse 25, when God looks at all the work that he had done, when he looks at his creation, what does he say as he looks at his creation? Four different times. It is good. And then we get down to verse 31, and at the very end of Genesis chapter 1, what does God say? As he looks at everything that he has made over those first six days, he looks at everything that he has made, including man and woman, and behold, it was what? Very good. So it, after he's creating each day, he says, it's good, it's good, it's good. The work that I've done, it was good. And then when he looked at all of creation, he says, it is very good. But there's a very important thing I want to say here, and that's this. He did not say in verse 31, it is perfect. You ever think about that? Why didn't God say, everything I made was perfect? Because what does perfection imply? It can't get any better. It can't get any better. 
So God says as he's creating each day, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then at the end of all of creation, it is very good. Not it is perfect, but it is very good. And then God creates Adam and he puts him on the planet to take those raw materials that God had made, which were very good. And then Adam's job was to take that which was very good and make it better. Because it wasn't perfect. Do you understand that? Does that make sense? So he says it's very good. He doesn't say it's perfect. And then he puts Adam in the middle of the garden and he says, you go and make this world a better place. That's why God created Adam to make what he had take what he had made to take what he had made and make it even better. You go and you work the ground and you keep it, Adam. Let me illustrate this in this way. Every Sunday when my wife shows up here for worship on Sunday morning, she is perfect. She looks exquisite. Her, look at her. I mean, look. Her hair is perfect. Her clothes are pressed and ironed. Her makeup is perfect. She is magnificent. She's perfect when she shows up here on Sunday morning. But a couple hours earlier, <laughs> when she first rolls out of bed, she is very good. Can I say that? I don't know. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Hopefully it makes sense because I'm going to sleep on the couch tonight. So I'm hoping that illustration made sense. I hope it was worth it. So God takes that which is very good and he tells Adam, now you go make it even better. You take the raw materials that I have created and you make it better. Now the fall changed everything. And now as a result of the fall, there's a lot of things in our world that are very bad. But you know what? Even in the midst of our fallen state, you know what God wants us to do? You know why God put us here? You know why God wired you with the gifts and the talents and the abilities that he's given you? Because he, you he wants to put you in the middle of it and he tells us, go make it better. You go make this world a better place. And the way you do that is by serving other people. It's by using those gifts and talents and abilities that I've given to you, that I've blessed you with, not just so that you can make a paycheck, but so that you can make this world a better place. You can serve me by serving humanity. That's what God wants for us. Our work is a way for us to worship God. When we do what God created us to do, we give him glory. We make this world a better place. And that's a good thing. Did you know the word vocation in English comes from a Latin word, voca? Our Latin students, what does the word voca mean? Anybody? To call. Your vocation should be a calling. It's a calling. In Latin, they might say something like medicum voca. That means call the doctor right, when I get sick. I need you to call the doctor. So our, our calling is our vocation. It's a voca. It's to call. God is calling you into a field of study. He is calling you into a field of work, into a career path that he designed you for. And if you are in a career path for which you were not designed, it's not going to go well for you. And you're going to be miserable every single day of your life. When we're at work, our vocation ought to put wind in our sails. It ought to do that for us. We should feel like, man, I am right in the center of God's will, and I am doing exactly what God designed me for. I'm doing exactly what God made me to do. And if your vocation doesn't do that, it might be time to look for a new vocation. A new calling, something that God has put upon your life. So often we think about, you know, a pastor having a call upon his life. And we use that terminology in seminary. Do you, have you been called by God to be a pastor? Well, the reality is everyone's got a calling upon their life. I might be called to be a minister because that's how God's wired me. That's what, put wind, that's what puts wind in my sails. 
but you might have a different calling, but it's a calling nonetheless. And your calling is, is no less valuable than my calling. And God has put you on this planet to make it a better place. In the book of Exodus, we read about two guys who had a calling upon their life. Their names were Bezalel and Aholiab. I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 31 together with me. And in this passage of scripture, Moses says that these two men, Bezalel and Aholiab, were filled with the Spirit of God. They were fi- That's not a phrase that you see very often in the Old Testament. These men were filled with the Spirit of God. But what is the context in which that statement is made? If you look in Exodus 31, the statement is made that these men were filled with the Spirit of God and it's in the context of work. It's in the context of the fact that God had created them to be master craftsmen. In other words, these guys were blue-collar guys. These were not pastors. These were not priests. These were blue-collar workers who loved to get their hands dirty, and God made them that way, and he filled them with that. Look at Exodus 31.1. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with what? The Spirit of God with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for settings, and in carving wood, to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahizamach, some great names in the Old Testament, of the tribe of Dan, and I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded." God has wired us to work, and through that work, to worship. These men were filled with the Spirit of God. And they weren't priests. They were just craftsmen. And God made them that way. And one of the primary ways we get to worship God is by giving Him glory through how we work. The problem, of course, is that because of the fall, because of Adam and Eve... Because they ate the forbidden fruit, now part of the curse for us is that work can be simultaneously fulfilling and super frustrating all at the same time. Amen? Anybody feel that way when you go to work? You feel like, I am doing what God wired me to do. I'm good at what I do. I'm good at this job. I'm good at my occupation. I'm good at my vocation. But at the same time, I just want to bang my head against the wall every time I go to my place of employment. Anybody ever feel that way? As a pastor, I feel that way. I feel so fulfilled as a pastor. I know I am right in the center of God's will for my life. I am doing what God created me to do. It puts wind in my sails. And at the same time, I want to bang my head against the wall almost every day when I go to work. Why? It's because of the fall. It's because sin messes everything up. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 and 19. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife. See guys, that's, that's the problem right there. It's always about it. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> it was a joke. I've already offended my wife, now I've offended all the ladies in the church. That's great. Should probably stop while I'm ahead. It says... To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and you ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken of the dust you are, and to dust you will return. So... The issue with the fall, part of the curse for us, is that work is fulfilling if we're in the vocation, the calling that God's put upon our life. But it's also super frustrating. And that's a result of the fall. It's a result of sin. Even though God designed us for work, because of the fall, work can become toilsome. Even when you're in the center of God's will. Even when you're right where God wants you to be, you're still going to be super frustrated a lot. See, some of you, you feel no fulfillment whatsoever in your place of employment. If that's the case, you probably need a different place of employment. But some of you do feel fulfilled in your place of employment, but you still feel frustrated a lot. 
And in that case, you don't need to change your place of employment because the grass always looks greener on the other side. And you think, man, if I could just get out of this office and go to that office, then everything would be great. And guess what's going to happen when you go to that office? Super frustrating things are going to happen. Why? Because that's a fallen place too. That's a place where there are fallen people working too. And sin messes everything up for us. We're running out of time. We have communion. There's still so much I want to say on this. Let's skip ahead. Let's look at Acts chapter 18. In the New Testament, do you remember what Paul's occupation was? Anybody? He was a tent maker. He was really into the circus. He loved Barnum and Bailey. <laughs> he was a tent maker. That was by trade, by occupation, by vocation. That's what Paul's calling was originally. That's what God wired him to do. Look at Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. After this, Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. And there he met a Jew named Aquila, a, who was a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. And because he was a what? A tent maker, as they were, he stayed and he worked with them. And every Sabbath, right, that's the day of rest, the day of worship, he didn't make tents on that day. He went into the synagogue and there he tried to persuade Jews and Greeks about Jesus. So let me ask you a question as we get ready to close this message up. What was Paul's primary passion in life? Paul's primary passion in life was spreading the gospel. But God had also made him good at making tents. And so he used his tent-making ability in order to make money so that he could continue to spread the gospel. God had given him the skill, and he used that skill for God's glory in order to make money so that he could give to the church, so that he could give to the poor, so that he could help others, so that he could advance the kingdom of God. And some of you, maybe that's where you are right now. Your greatest desire is to spread the gospel. And that's an awesome thing. But God has also given you a calling. He's put a vocation, a career path. He has that in mind for you. And maybe that's not to be a pastor. Maybe that's not to be a missionary who goes overseas. Maybe you're just supposed to be a missionary in your place of employment. Because God has put a calling upon your life. He's given you some gifts, some skills, some abilities. And he wants you to use that in order to advance the gospel through your tent making ability. Work is a way to worship God. Now as we close, let me give you the life application. You need to do your work for Christ and not just for a check. If you're doing your work just to get a check, man, you might need to find a different place of employment. You might need to find a different calling, a different career. If you're not finding any fulfillment whatsoever in your place of employment, you might need a different place of employment. But if at the same time it's fulfilling and frustrating, then you're probably right in the center of God's will. Because that's a result of the fall. So as you go to work on Monday morning, not tomorrow because we're off tomorrow, but on Tuesday morning this week, when you go to work... Do your work for Christ, not just for a check. Change your thinking. See that your work is a vad. It's not only work, but it's also worship. Colossians 3, 23 and 24, I leave you with these verses. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. As working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Use your work as an opportunity to worship the Lord. As we turn our attention to the communion table, 